to our contemporary service. We're so glad you joined us. We are about to just draw our hearts in closer to God. Doesn't matter whether you're in the living room or you'll be in the sanctuary, God is there. We praise God that He is the one that does it.
kingdom come. Our scripture reading today is from Psalm 130. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. Will you, will you please bow your heads with me in prayer? Ah, dear Lord, we're just thankful for another day of breath, Lord. Just as we just sang in that first song, just give us clean hands and pure hearts, Lord. Be with us uh, in this weird time where the church looks completely different than what we're used to. Be with every person right now. Link us together in unity of your spirit. Let your spirit fall upon everybody and let them feel refreshed today. Let them feel in tune with who you are, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for all these things in your name. Amen.
Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves It's a great day because God is with us. And isn't that wonderful news? The best of all, God is always with us, no matter where we are. You know, I find myself preaching in front of a, a TV camera. That, that's amazing to me because, you know, I'm so used to preaching to a congregation, yet we find ourselves together. And I thank God for technology. I'm reminded of a story that I've told some of you, so if this is familiar to you, I apologize, but... But uh, Randy Rogers was one of my supervisors in my supervised ministry when I was working at the Veterans Home during seminary. I remember one time going out to see him preach. And he pre was preaching in the Alzheimer's wing. And he preached an amazing sermon. It was eloquent. It was well-researched. He had worked so hard on it. And I was just blown away by the sermon. But I looked around, and half of the room was asleep. The other half, because of their medical condition, would not remember much of what he taught. So I went up to him afterwards and said, Randy, how did you do that? He says, do what? I said, work so hard on a sermon, preach such an eloquent message, knowing that this is the Alzheimer's wing. He says, what are you talking about? I wasn't preaching for them, I was preaching for God. See, that's, that's high ceiling thinking. That, that's, that's high ceiling thinking that says, I don't care what, what is happening, that I know that there is a future, and I know that God is still in control, and I know that God's got this whole thing. That's high ceiling thinking, and that's what we're talking about this morning. We're going to be looking at John chapter 11. It's a wonderful story of Lazarus, that great story about on the week before Jesus was betrayed. He stopped by at Bethany, and he raised a man who had been dead and smelling. Seems impossible, doesn't it? But it happened. John 11, verse 1 a man named Lazarus was sick, and he lived in Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. Now, just a little aside, this is also the Martha who, the last time Jesus was around, uh, she was too busy cleaning to spend time with Jesus, so she always gets kind of hammered for that. But we find out she's a, a bulwark of faith as well. She's an amazing lady. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So you're looking forward to that day when God will get glory because of the coronavirus. Not that he caused it, but boy, just watch out. See what God is doing. We already see him working in an amazing way here. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Please hear that. He loved them. But there was a little lull in the time between. He knew about it, but he left them for two days. And Lazarus died, and then he had to make a journey. But he loved them so much that we will get the shortest verse in all the Scripture he wept. He wept because he saw their sorrow. 
Oh, please believe that God loves you right now. Nothing's changed, no matter what's going on out there. Nothing has changed. He's still on his throne, and he still adores you. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea are trying to stone you. See, Bethany was in the region of Judea. He says, are you going there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is a dangerous stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But now I will go and wake him up. <laughs> the disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I am glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come, let's see him. <laughs> Isn't that an amazing passage? That, that he's glad he wasn't there because this is an opportunity for God to get some glory. Can we get to that place where we say, you know, I'm not glad the coronavirus is hit, but I'm glad that God will get glory out of this, that, that we're so looking forward to what God is going to do as we work through this thing that, as we move through. You see, Jesus is always calling us to that. He's always trying to call us out of those tombs that we try to build around ourselves. He doesn't allow his friends to sink into the, the grave. He says, come out of that grave. He says it to Lazarus as well as we get into it. But this is something that Jesus is always trying to work on. Now, now we know that we've watched Jesus meet a couple of people as we work through the Gospel of John. You know, we remember how it was in John chapter 3 how he met Nicodemus. Nicodemus, that Pharisee, who came to him in fear. And Jesus called him out of that fear and said, Nicodemus, you come and walk with me. You will have eternal life. Beautiful message, right? Whoever believes can have this. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been. Uh, Jesus calls us all to this. You can have eternal life through him. Of course, then we moved on to the, the, the woman of Samaria, that, that, that woman who, who thought that nobody cared about her. And Jesus stops and has a conversation with the woman at Samaria and gives her hope. No more walls built around her. Jesus comes right to her. We see it again with the, the blind man. We talked about last week how Jesus walks right into this blind man's life and changes the situation. And all of a sudden, the man can see. And again, today, we see you know, Jesus bringing his miracles and his message right into the midst of this incredible mess where he says, I can even take resurrection and life right to the edge of the grave and call somebody out from the grave. <laughs> Only Jesus can do that. And, and he's looking at people who don't think that it's possible. But he says the whole time, I know that I can do this. Because that's what he calls people to. Look what he says here. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe that you will, be, uh, that you will see the glory of God? You know, I, I look at this and I think of, of, of this low ceiling in a grave. It's a tragic thing. You know, when you go into a grave, it's, it's really low. I mean, we've all seen caskets. We can only imagine how low that is. But we, we think of Taj Mahal, and we think of, uh, of you know, King Tut's grave. And we think, well, those are high ceilings. But they weren't. They were very low ceilings. And, and you think about the smell and the dankness and all that that would have been going on in a grave like that. And they would have had, had shells built where they could bury a couple generations on those because they were hard to dig. You can imagine digging into a stone. You know, they didn't dig one for every time somebody died. Very seldom. Only the rich had that. The average person buried many people in the same grave. And so Jesus is calling them out of this dank, stinky place, saying, I could take you to a better place. I could take you to a more glorious place. Do you have that kind of mindset? I, I think that's a, a high way of thinking, that you could think in the midst of somebody being in a grave, that I could bring you out and call you out from even a grave. You know, when we were just came back from Tennessee, when this all started to break, you might remember that, you know, I told you about how we all Cloroxed our hands every stop we made on the way back, making sure that we didn't bring anything back to Indiana. And uh, we're so glad that we did that because we understand it wasn't some of the states that we came through, but we came through without any problems. And we're so glad we all got home healthy. But, but here's the thing, friends. While we were there, we worked hard and we did a lot of good projects. But we were all looking forward to this trip that we were going to make at the end of the week because we made an evening trip to Ruby Falls. 
I, I, I have a shameless plug here for what a great salesman I am. See that wife there? Um, I'm a great salesman, as you can see. And, and uh, you know, we took a stop there at that Ruby Falls there with the, the group, and that, the, you see the water falling there behind us. That's known as Ruby Falls. It's the deepest, highest um, waterfall in the whole world. It's an amazing thing to see. And we had this opportunity to go down there. It's 26 stories deep. The, the man that, that went there, Leo Lambert, he, he went into this. They, they drilled down there trying to find another tunnel, but, but he found this cavern. And he said, i got to see what's it back this cavern. It, 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 many places through that cavern, and fact, most of it, was 18 inches high. I want you to picture 18 inches and think about crawling through that. Think, what if I get stuck? What if I can't turn around? But he said, I was just drawn to it. I knew there was something back there. I could hear something. I knew something was happening back there. I had to see it. There was something big back there. I just had to, to keep crawling. And, and he did. And he crawled the whole way back. And he found a very high ceiling. The water falling from the ceiling. This amazing sight. They have since carved it all out. And you can walk back. It's a tourist trap now. But, but uh, still, it's a little bit narrow. And, and it's just room to pass as you go back to this thing. But it's about a mile journey. Think of, of crawling a mile to get back to this falls. He got there. He was so impressed with it, he, he decided to name it after his wife, Ruby. And he, he crawled back and got his wife and said, you got to see this. And they both crawled the whole way to see this high ceiling. Friends, are we crawling through this so that we can see a high ceiling? I hope that you are. I hope that you see this as an opportunity to get to a very high place in your life. We're going to talk about how we might get to that because I believe that God wants us to do some really high, high ceiling thinking. But I know we have a temptation. People have always had this temptation to go back to low ceiling thinking. There is always somebody with a cup that's half empty. That has never been the, you know, no exception to that. I have always had people around me that had a low ceiling around them. But I've also have always had high ceiling people around me. And it's really the way you want to look at the world. And I believe that this is an opportunity to, to have some high ceiling thinking. No matter what other people are saying, I have a, a short letter I want to read to you. This is a letter written to President Jackson back when the railroad was trying to start. It goes like this. As you may know, Mr. President... Railroad carriages are pulled at the enormous speed of 15 miles per hour. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. <laughs> By engines which, in addition to endangering life and limb of passengers, roar and snort their way through the countryside, setting fire to crops, scaring the livestock, and frightening women and children. The Almighty certainly never intended that people should travel at such breakneck speeds, 15 miles per hour. That's Martin Van Buren, the governor of New York at the time. There is always somebody like that to say it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it's impossible, we'll never get through this. But we are not those kind of people. We are Christians who believe that Jesus called Lazarus out of grave and defeated the grave himself. We know that all things are possible because God is on his throne and we're going to get through this. I mean, anyone that can stand out of st outside a grave and say this to a grieving sister, take away the stone, he said, but Lord... <laughs> This man's been dead. By this time, there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. It's easy to get negative, isn't it? And she's a believer. She says, I believe that you're the Messiah. I believe that you're the one that was to come. I believe that. She's a, a believer, but you see, this is a temptation for even believers. You're not a non-believer because you're scared right now. You're not a non-believer because you're fearful. I want you to know you can be a believer and this stuff can still enter into your life, but you need to say no to it. Just say no, as we say. Just say no to that kind of emotion and say, we're going to get through this. We're going to be careful. We're going to be smart. We're going to use all the sanitizer. We're going to keep the social distancing. We're going to listen to CDC, but, we're, but we are not going to get into negativity here. We are going to keep marching forward. Jesus calls us to this. This is what we are called to. This isn't uh, something that's an option. This is what Jesus insists for all the people that follow him. It wasn't just Mary and Martha, but everyone that was around him. He was always calling them to see things in a bigger scope. He wanted us to have a kingdom view. He taught us to pray, thy kingdom come on earth. He never wanted us to get into small living. Never, no matter what's going on. I love how, how Hebrews writer puts it, how we've got to keep our focus on him. This is a great passage. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, 
scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I want you to think about that now. I know it's difficult to think about resurrection when we're up to our eyeballs in, you know, that, that old song, you know, it's a tough world, rough world, gets you where it hurts world. But let me tell you something. There is a God of resurrection calling us into high ceiling thinking. Do you ever notice church architecture is often real high ceilings? If you've been inside Grace Church, you know that this picture doesn't do, the ju- do this justice. But I, I wanted to have Pastor Kathy here so, because it's so important to what I'm talking about. As you know, this sanctuary is, what is it, 40 or 50 feet high. It's, it's an amazing sight when you're in here. But I've got to tell you something. This is what makes it. Human beings that come into a high ceiling like this and have high ceiling thinking. Let's say, you know, all things are possible if God is in control. That, 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 that all things are possible through Christ. That believe that no matter what they're going through, something can, good can come out of it. I've watched Pastor Kathy like this. We've all watched Pastor Kathy like this. And I think she is an amazing symbol here, what I'm talking about here. That that when you watch someone go through everything that Pastor Kathy is going through with the death of her first husband and then watch her children die and all the struggles that she's had, and yet she just keeps her head up and keeps ministering to everybody around her. This is what we are called to, friends. This is high ceiling thinking. This is saying I'm not giving up just because I'm going through some tough stuff. Our lives are bigger than graves, friends, way bigger. They're eternal lives because we believe in Jesus Christ. So I want to talk about some high ceiling thinking that still goes on today. Because this isn't just for pastors. This isn't just for some people. This is something for all kingdom thinkers. If you're a, a member of this kingdom, then I've got to tell you, this is your opportunity to think big, even in the midst of the coronavirus outbreak, even in the midst of being locked into your homes and, and trying to stay six feet away from everybody. This is still a time to say, I've got opportunity to do amazing things right now. I, I like Philippians 127. This is what we are called to. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? That the God so loved the world that he gave his son, and that son came into the world. He was tempted in every way. He did everything, uh, uh, defeated every one of those temptations. He went to a cross, you know, the worst temptation of all, to, to go and to die on that cross and take sin, the whole sin of all the world, unto himself. Anybody that can do that, we've got to live our lives worthy of that. That's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That's the one we're following. Let us never forget who we follow here. We're following one who didn't just talk about it, who didn't just insist that Mary and Martha had faith when he was raised in Lazarus, but he himself had to have faith when he went to a grave and waited on his Father in heaven to raise him from death because he had no control over that. He submitted all the way to death. This is a time to look for the big picture. You know, here's, here's the thing, friends. On that morning after we got the CDC warning that came out that said no more gatherings over 50 people, well, of course, that immediately created a big problem for yours truly as a pastor leading this congregation. And I had to make a decision how we go forward here. And I looked at the pioneer and perfecter of my faith, and I, I, I said, okay, staff, we're going to meet in the Welcome Center. We're all set at separate tables, and we're going to have a conversation. And we sat down, and first thing I told them, all your job descriptions just changed, every one of them. But we're not playing dead because we don't play dead around here. We remain a church in the midst of this. So here's the thing. We're going to get out all the membership lists. And we're going to divide up all the names. Everybody's going to call some people. So immediately, Doris and Chris began working on that. As soon as we got this list, we started calling people. And we've been calling and calling and calling. The Stephen minister picked up this week and, and said, we, we want to make those calls for you this week. And the staff will be going back to it this uh, coming week because we want to stay connected. We've got to be the best church that we could possibly be in the midst of what we're going through. And we're doing it. I, I want you to know that, that you know, th- this is going to end. And we need to be the strongest church that we can be when we come out of this. And we're making plans for that. We don't know when this is going to end, but, but we know that someday it's going to end. And when it does our big picture focus is we've got to be ready for mission work. So one of the things I did last Monday is I drove up to uh, Rural Valley 
I said Grand Valley at the earlier service. I got that wrong. Rural Valley, because there's a parsonage there that needs a lot of work. I met with the district superintendent and the contractor to see what needed to be done. It's all interior work, basically drywall work and painting and that sort of thing. And I said, this is a great mission trip for us to just run up there. It, it'll make a great Saturday mission trip for us. And we're going to plan that in May or June, whenever we get to it. But we need to have it ready for July 1st. But we're, we're going to do this because I believe we've got to stay in ministry because our mission statement is not to maintain the status quo. You get that? <laughs> we are not about maintaining the status quo. That is no mission statement. That is the mission statement of a dying church, and we're not into that. Our mission statement has a big focus, a ceiling uh, thinking. Uh, our mission statement is engage one another in ministry, empower one another's gifts, and to expand the kingdom of God through acts of love. I'm so proud of our food bank. Our food bank has really stepped up their game during this. It's an emergency food bank. And they have you know, changed the protocol to keep everybody safe. The old people, the older members that, that help to take care of it, they're not going out and doing the shopping. They have some of the younger members doing that. We, and, and by the way, if there's any younger members that would like to help, they can enlist you on that to do the shopping, to put the food in there so that when they come, they can get, get the uh, basket ready and they sit it outside so that they don't have to interact because their lives would be in danger. They're being smart, but they're also taking care of people and being a church. That's what we are about. That's what we will always be about. That's what we've been about, and we're not about to stop just because of this. We know that things will work out. We know that we're going to get to that place. So I want to end with a card that I received from my SPRC chair and his wife, Linda. Earl sent this card. It says, five things to remember. We are never alone. Number two, nothing takes him by surprise. Number three, when we are weak, he is strong. Number four, he is the God of new beginnings. And number five, his love never gives up on us. We believe that with all of our hearts around here. You know, it's one thing to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It's one thing to believe that he was the one that was to come. It's a whole other thing to believe that God can do the impossible and that God can open up even graves and God can do amazing things in the midst of all of this. Here's what I believe God can do. God can give us an opportunity to do what we pray for all the time, that the kingdom would come in our lives. Friends, this is a perfect opportunity. So many of you are laid off from work. Your kids are home. This is an opportunity to connect with your families in a way that you haven't for a long time. This is an opportunity to, to, to connect with nature and this beautiful creation that God has put all around us. This is your opportunity to take control of your own spiritual journey and say, I'm in a Lenten journey. I want to be a stronger Christian when Lent ends than I was when it started. To say, I want to lead my family as for me and my house will serve the Lord. That's what we are called to at this time. And I pray that all of us will come out of this in a much better place. So let us pray together. Oh, Lord God, it is a pleasure, just an absolute pleasure to hear your word and to be reminded of the glories of these, these stories. They're true stories. They're not just stories. They're the things that really happen. They're amazing stories. That Jesus stood out of a grave where a man had been dead for four days. It smelled and he called him out of the grave. I pray for those who are making ruts that are becoming graves. Lord, draw them out. Call them out of those ruts. I pray that, that all of us, Lord, could come to high living. That not a single one of us would slip. Not a single one of us would settle. Not a single one of us would just go into maintaining but we would look forward to a bright future for us, for our families, for our church, for our community, and for our world. God, we pray for our president. We pray for our Congress people on both sides of the aisle. They all need your help, Lord. Give them wisdom from above. Guide them into making all the best decisions. We pray for this stimulus package to do everything that it's intended to do with as little harm as possible. We pray for families that, that find themselves just so unsure that they feel like they're in a stinking grave right now. And I pray that they would just hear this message and grasp it and own it to know that they would be drawn out of that grave and on higher ground. Lord, we pray that you would make us to be high-thinking people, 
that, that we would just have our heads on straight and that we would not lose focus on what this is really about. We have prayed it a million times, Lord, that you would make your kingdom come on earth. And we mean it. We desire it. We want nothing more, less than your kingdom to come on earth. God, we do pray for, for a cure. We pray that that would happen very soon. We pray for a vaccine as soon as possible. We know there are a lot of restraints on that, but we do believe, Lord, that, that, that a cure is in the mix. And we pray that you would just bring that. Make it happen. Pray for the doctors, the scientists, the CDC, and who, and all the people that have to make all these decisions. Give them wisdom, Lord. Help them to make the, the kind of decisions that will deliver us from this. We pray that we will see the death rate drop, not just to 1%, although it's nearing that here in America. We pray it will go lower and lower and lower until finally not a single person is dying from this. We pray your blessing. And we pray your direction, even as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, Grace. Is this is Carrie Pinos, married to your contemporary worship well, director, Will Pinos. We're so thankful that you've been faithful. Hi, Grace. This is Carrie Pinos, married to your contemporary worship director, Will Pinos. We're so thankful that you've been faithful in giving your tithes and offerings during this time. We ask that you would continue to do that when we can't physically be together. Uh, there are several different ways that you can do that. You can go to indianagrace.org and click the donate button to give online. You can mail a check to P.O. Box 6, Indiana, PA, 15701. You can use your mobile banking app to send a check to the church in that way. Uh, and you can also uh, come up to the church, the all-access entrance, and drop off a check in the new uh, deposit box there. Take care, everyone. Thank you. I just wanted to make a quick announcement real quick. I just wanted to thank Audra and Joel Moore and Jacob Christian for coming in and uh, give a quick plug to all the parents out there watching. This is why music education is important. For times like this, uh, just get your kids, if they're sitting around doing nothing, maybe they want to learn to play a guitar or a piano or whatever you might have laying around the house, get them hitting pots and pans because you never know what God will do with that. I never thought this would be what I'd be doing, Sean, you know what I'm saying? So in Jesus' name. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was resting and my life began, the ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, and my life began. with you. Hey. Release 
from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Thank you for the music today. It's always great to be led in worship, isn't it? I hope that we were able to lead you in worship. We do have a wonderful opportunity tonight. We'll be doing a, a whole different service outside in the parking lot. Looks like God has arranged the, the weather calendar just perfectly for us. We're supposed to have some rain. We're supposed to have some wind. And then it's supposed to clear out around 5 o'clock. 6 o'clock, we're going to gather. 6 o'clock, we're going to begin with live music. You'll be able to watch it live. You can also uh, watch it on Facebook. But we are going to be shut, uh, throttling down the wireless so that our Facebook feed will go well because the Facebook feed is going to go straight to the radio station and come out on, on Mug Radio. So we hope that you can join us for that. You can stay in your car, stay safe, and if the weather's going to be warm enough, you'll be able to sit in your car without getting cold. So we look forward to, to uh, being able to be out and being safe and being together as a congregation. Now, uh, I just have one bit more wisdom after the benediction. We want to invite everybody to go to your kitchen and enjoy some food and fellowship. Just a joke. Will you receive the benediction? Now unto Almighty God who can call us out of a grave, out of our ruts, and into a big, high-ceiling thinking. To that God be all honor and glory in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>